Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to tonight's presentation. Uh, we'll be focusing on praying for the sick and the dying, especially the Divine Mercy Chaplet. With me is uh, a friend of many years, Reverend Father Seraphim Minkalenko, a priest of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. Father just celebrated recently his 90th birthday. He is well known as an expert in the field of Divine Mercy. He was vice postulator for the cause of um, St. Faustina's beatification years ago and uh, was at the altar with uh, St. Pope John Paul II when uh, St. Faustina was canonized in the year 2000. He's been guiding our ministry, Eucharistic Apostles of the Divine Mercy, for over 20 some years and uh, helped us with our cynical books. And uh, I have a great uh, love for him and his uh, help helping us get started in our ministry. In this time of uh, suffering and turmoil and confusion in the world, I asked Father to join us so we can uh, talk about St. Faustina and uh, her love for the dying and God's mercy. But Father, it's important that uh, when we talk about God's mercy, that the soul has to uh, ask for repentance and want to repent and change his sinful ways. You know, the ABCs of mercy, the A stands for ask for mercy. Um, many times we just think God's mercy is there and uh, we don't even ask for it or we, we don't want to change. So how can God's mercy work in us? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we can, the Lord has made great promises through many saints, uh, through many different uh, revelations. And, but I believe none so much as the ones on his mercy through Sister Faustina. And uh, some people think that this is too easy uh, to just say, Jesus, I trust in you and everything's okay. But what it means is that you are in tune with him, that he is, you are really connected up with the Lord so that his life and the effects of it can penetrate us and uh, assure us of the fulfillment of his promises in us. His main purpose is salvation. That means to be with him in eternity, that at our death and our resurrection, as Christ was resurrected after his death, our nature will be transformed. It will be made spiritual so that it can be a, a partaker of the divine life itself, which uh, is eternal happiness, eternal meaning never ending. And God is eternal and we will be able to participate in that even though we had a beginning where God did not have a beginning. And so the whole goal for us being created is that we will be transformed by union with God through Jesus, and we will uh, be with him forever in eternal uh, joy and, and fulfillment. And so what we need, if we are conscious of sin, of something that separated us, our spirit, from uh, God in Trinity, that we will repent by saying, Lord, I'm sorry for having offended you. I accept your son's work of redemption by forgiving all my sins, and I accept his forgiveness. And in this way, he is able to assure me of the fruits, which is eternal happiness salvation. But salvation is not only forgiveness of sins to reunite us in spirit with the Holy Trinity. Salvation covers all the aspects of our human life, our spirits, our souls, and our bodies. These three intertwine. In the very end of the epistle to the Thessalonians, he says, may the uh, God of peace uh, grant you all health in spirit, mind, and body. And it is through the spirit that we have union with the triune God. The soul 
receives the inspirations from the spirit, but has to make the decisions whether it accepts them or not and put them into uh, uh, effect. And that influences what happens to our bodily life. And it has everything to do with uh, our health and our, our well being uh, physically. Because our minds ha can have a great influence on how our body behaves. And if we have a pessimistic view of life or our circumstances, et cetera, uh, it can wear us down and have a very uh, ill effects on us. Uh, or for example, one important thing is, if we have an unforgiving spirit, if we do not do what the Lord commanded us by giving us the prayer of the Our Father and forgive us our trespasses or our debts, as we, as we forgive our debtors. If we do not forgive everyone, everything from the heart, neither can the Lord forgive us. As the Lord says, uh, not that God does not want to forgive, but he can't because we don't allow him to. That's where our freedom that he gives us. It's not free to choose evil. It's freedom to choose the good and to exercise the good. And the major good is forgiveness. Now, I, I made this discovery for myself at one point where I read um, an explanation of a priest of the Congregation of the Precious Blood in Italy, who was a scripture scholar. And he had a problem with one of the Psalms where we say, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord of my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your infirmities. And he says, something isn't right here, because uh, the whole psalm is about God's mercy. And then he speaks of benefits. And he says, Hebrew poetry, which the Psalms are, are not based on rhyme and rhythm, but upon one verse following another. And that following verse explains the first one in different words, so that you have the same truth proclaimed in two ways, one confirming the other. So he said, what is this word? do not forget his benefits. So he looked it up in the Hebrew language and he found out that it comes from a earlier language, the Ugarit. And there he found instances in the Ugarit uh, writings where the word is interpreted pardonings, pardoning. And so this is, wait a minute, that makes sense. And forget not all his pardonings, who pardons all your sins and heals all your infirmities. And because the sin is pardoned, the healing is there. And he says, that makes sense. So what that presents to us, that beautiful Psalm, is that God continuously pardons us and he pardons us ahead of time. St. Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ offered his life for us and gained us pardon. He became sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God. You know, Father, it's amazing to me how St. Faustina, with only a couple winters of education, could write such profound things in her diary. Uh, one of my quotes I remember she wrote about, we resemble God most when we forgive our neighbors. Precisely, yes. And, and yet, you know, you know, I know forgiveness is so difficult. And she had a great love for the dying. Um, and uh, the Lord told her, pray as much as you can by, for the dying by your insistent prayers obtain for them trust in my mercy because they have the most need of trust and the have at the least. Sooner would heaven and earth turn into nothingness and would my mercy not embrace a trusting soul. 
So we get back to asking and trusting and you know, we have to do our part as well. Well, as St. Paul says, how do we gain faith? That means believing God that what he says is true. He says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But to hear the word of God, somebody has to preach it. Somebody has to let us know what that word is. And this is why he sends us his special emissaries, like the people who he gives revelations to. And that's what his whole scriptures are. All the scriptures are his word to us that you can, you have to accept in, for exactly what they say. And they have the effect of convincing you in your spirit that your soul accepts it and acts upon it. That you say yes to what he offers you. And then it has its effect in us. And so um, particularly is at the moment that a person is going to be separated from this life and into the next that is most important. And that is why further on in her diary towards the end of it, she gives us the uh, inspiration that uh, at our last moment, God gives us that lucid grace that if we want to, we can accept his pardon and we will respond with such an act of love that it will take away all our sins and punishment and that soul uh, is accepted into eternal life. And that all of us will receive that, that grace. But if we are not willing to accept it, then even he cannot help us and we condemn ourselves. You know, but I think of in my own life, you know, God is love. And I, I one day I was just thinking about <clears throat> in my own life when I felt love. And I remember an episode in high school playing football and our team was playing for the league championship. We were supposed to get clobbered and uh, we ended up winning the game. But with a minute or so to go, uh, I caught a pass and kept the, the, the game going, the drive going, and we ended up scoring and winning. And my little mother after the game ran across the field and gave me this big hug, you know, and, and I, it, now mom's gone. And it almost brings me to tears thinking of how much she was proud of me. She loved me so much. And that's just a grain of sand compared to the beaches of Florida uh, of God's love for us. And um, Faustina understood God's love and mercy. And, um, but the chaplet, what, how, what are some of the promises? He gave her some incredible promises of, of praying the chaplet at the bedside of the dying. Okay, we have to understand what the prayer of the chaplet is all about. The most important thing that the Lord wants for us is eternal life through his death in his human nature. This is why he uh, took upon himself our human nature, because that's in which we were wounded. We were separated from God by our rebellion, which we unfortunately inherited from our first parents and their disobedience, where they wanted to be God. Uh, as the devil says, you will become gods knowing good and evil. And they fell for it. And... Uh, handed over the uh, authority over the world to the devil. And so we had to be saved from that. Our rebellion had to be um, uh, paid for in a sense. St. Paul says, the wages of sin is death. In other words, sin earns death, spiritual death, separation from God. So that had to be injustice overcome. That death had to be experienced by somebody in the human nature to take away the effects of that rebellion. And 
all, who could pay such a tremendous debt as a rebellion against the creator, except somebody who was divine, but also in our human nature, so he could die, because as divine, he was eternal, he could not die. But in our human nature, he could, and in this way, he could pay the debt. And that's why in another one, the, I think it's to the Philippians, the letter, he says, he took the bill that was owed and mailed it to the cross, so this is paid in full. And therefore, all of us can take advantage of that. We turn to him with thanks and praise that he had paid the debt, and it is applied to us. And that's why, but okay, so what entailed paying the debt? Death, uh, that was the penalty for sin. And so Jesus took on himself that death, how do we know? He gave us that prayer, O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. So we address two things, blood and water. But the Lord taught that prayer to Sister Faustina in Polish. And although he addressed blood and water, two things, the verb which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus is in the singular as you conjugate the verb. And then at the end, I trust in you, that last you is in the singular. So what does it mean? The blood and water stands for Jesus in his death because the blood separates into its two main uh, components, uh, blood and water, only after a person's death, unless in the lab you shake them up and, and separate them. But in the case of our Lord, it was after he died that when his side was pierced, out came blood and water. And that means he truly died. He paid the penalty in full. All right? So, uh, so it stands for Jesus' greatest act of love, where he gave his life, so that pays the debt for our sin. And, but he, that's why we address him blood and water. Now, his very name, Jesus, comes from the Hebrew, Yeshua. This was the name that the angel said Mary and Joseph were to give to the child that was to be born. Yeshua means God is salvation. And as we say, salvation isn't only forgiveness of sins, but all healing and fulfillment in every respect uh, to our person and our nature. And so when we address him as blood and water, we are addressing him in that fundamental purpose why he became a human being and undertook to suffer in our place. And what he did, I don't know how many of the viewers have seen the film by Mel Gibson, The Passion of the Christ, to see to what degree our Lord suffered particularly in his passion. And um, all that we saw was just scratching the surface of what he really suffered. And his greatest suffering was in his spirit. And his greatest hurt was abandonment by his father in heaven at the moment of death. He cried out, my God, he couldn't even call him father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the greatest wound a human being can feel, being rejected by one's father. But he underwent that as in his human nature in order that we may be convinced that we are always accepted by the father thanks to what he did for us. And we have to be aware of that and we have to accept it. So he took upon himself all our shame in order that we may have his glory. He took away, he, he suffered that intense uh, internal hurt 
of abandonment in order that we may know we are never abandoned by our Heavenly Father. And um, this is why he also gave us that special uh, hour of great mercy, three o'clock every afternoon, the hour of his, especially his abandonment at the hour of death. And that's when he wants us to pray for the conversion of sinners, especially. You see how all those things match and how they fit together and how we are able with Jesus at that hour to bring him to him all those who despair their life or their salvation by applying to them uh, the merits of our Lord at that hour. Being a doctor, I took care of a lot of very, very sick people. I had people, you know, die in front of me. And, and back then that was BC before Christ in a way. Um, you know, when I read things where Faustina and St. Faustina writes, when the chapel is said by the bedside of a dying person, God's anchor is placated, unfathomable mercy envelops the soul. In the very depths of my tender mercy, I move for the sake of the sorrowful passion of my son. And he also said he would be there as the merciful savior and not as a just judge. Okay, but that, that first part says um, the wrath of God is placated. Yes. We have to understand what the wrath of God is. It's not a change of mood in God. He always envelops us in his love, meaning going out to us for our good no matter what happens to him. That's what true, true love is. Offering yourself in somebody else's place for your benefit, not mine, all right? So God's mood never changes. We, his love is always radiating upon us. But if we stop it, it is not able to take its effect. And we feel his action upon us as his anger against our rottenness. But it's really a, a, a sentiment in us, not in God. He is pouring out his warmth of light and life with love. But if we put up a barrier, we think he's mad at us because it's burning us. And so we have to give it up and accept his pardon. And then uh, his love has its saving effect. <clears throat> so the wrath of God is something that we feel when we feel guilty, but it's not a change of mood in God. And, uh, but this is the way we express it in, uh, in the Old Testament, especially it speaks a lot of God's anger at different moments against his people, but that's because of their stiff neck. They were rebelling against them continuously, so they could not see him as loving uh, because of their stance against him. Before we uh, get into the praying for the at the bedside of the sick and dying and during Eucharistic adoration, could you comment on one of our seven sacraments, the anointing of the sick and even the uh, special uh, apostolic blessing? What educate us? What what what's going on? You know. Well, uh, there are. We have the sacrament of reconciliation, which is confession, which means I agree with God that I'm a sinner. And Saint um, John the Apostle, in his first letter, points out. If we say that we do not sin, we are liars and there is no truth in us. That means God is truth and he cannot be in us if we call him a liar. When we say we're not sinners, when we are. But he says when we acknowledge our sins, when we confess, confess means to acknowledge, to say so, what the truth is. God is faithful to assure us uh, uh, of his forgiveness. And that's why he gave us the sacrament of reconciliation, where we can express 
our agreement with them, Lord have mercy on me the sinner. And often in the scriptures, it's not translated exactly correctly. The use the translation is uh, like the, the publican in, in the parable, God forgive me a sinner. But in the Greek from which the scriptures are translated to us from the Hebrew, there is a definite article before that word evil and, uh, and sinner. And by the definite article being there, it says, forgive me the sinner. I'm placing myself as the worst of sinners, not just a sinner among others. And that shows deep repentance. And the Lord says, he went home justified where the Pharisee did not. Okay, so when we admit our sins, then we are assured we're forgiven. And it was brought to my attention when I was listening to some teachings by this Messianic Jew, Jonathan Kahn. And he said that in, in the Old Testament, when a person brought the animal, usually a lamb, for uh, the forgiveness or for the covering of his sins, the, the uh, victim, meaning the specially assigned animal to be sacrificed, um, had to be uh, completely uh, pure. It had to be completely uh, in integral to be worthy of an offering to God. And when it was recognized as that, then the person would put his hands on the head of the lamb confess all his sins, and in this way, transfer them to the lamb. Then the lamb was sacrificed to pay the penalty of death for his sins. But he would be covered. In the Old Testament, they were not taken away. They were covered, and the punishment would not follow. All right. So what happened uh, when uh, Jesus declared that he was the Messiah? And the high priest tore his garments and he said, he blasphemed. Now, where was the sin here? Jesus told the truth, he is God. They said, no, you're not. That was their sin. And what were the priests doing? They went up to him and hit him over the head. They put their sin on his head. He paid the penalty afterwards. Mm. And if they would acknowledge it, they would be forgiven. So when we go to confession, the priest is just a cover up for Jesus. And it's on his head by reciting the sins to the priest that we place all the sins. And then the priest in his name can say, you're forgiven because you acknowledge them and you transferred them. And Jesus already paid the penalty. So you are now scot-free. Can you see the working there? You know, Father, as a doctor, again, and being in critical situations with people, uh, their last moments of their life, you know, we're all busy doing everything we can, IVs going, tubes being put here and there and everywhere. And, and yet, um, many times we don't think about the, what's going on spiritually. This is the most important part of this person's life here. And we forget to think about, this man's Catholic, he, we, we should call the priest and the priest with the anointing of the sick. And, uh, and again, if they're so far gone, they can't even say a, a confession, but that doesn't matter really, does it? With the priest comes and. Uh, well, here's the thing. <clears throat> we are given the sacrament of uh, anointing of the sick. The Lord told the disciples, go out and heal the people anointing them with oil. He gave us special power to the oil. And as they anointed the people, they, were be they became well. We need something tangible to prove to us that something's going on. And that's why this is a healing thing for us when we are anointed with the oil. And as uh, in St. James' letter, we find 
He says, if someone is ill, call in the presbyters, the elders of the church, and they will pray over him and anoint him with oil. And if he be in sin, they are forgiven. And so even though a person may be unconscious in, in a coma, when he is anointed with the oil, his sins, if there are any, are forgiven. And uh, Faustina proves that in her, uh, where she writes that many times a person is in such a state that he cannot externally show any sign of repentance, whatever. But when he is prayed over and anointed, that sacrament takes hold. And we must also be aware that hearing is the last thing that goes. And even though a person is in coma, they hear everything that's going around around, going on around them. And they can respond to what is being told them. And this is how the Lord works his mercy upon even those who uh, we don't know what the situation of the soul is because we have no external way of knowing it. But we can believe, for Sarastina says, that the action of God is going on in that soul. Now, is the special apostolic blessing something extra, or is that part of the anointing of the sick? Or uh... Well, it's part of the prayers, because usually the anointing is accompanied by a prayer that says what the anointing is all about. And so the, the, we are given an assurance by that extended prayer of forgiveness uh, to uh, uh, allow the, the soul to hear uh, that pardon being given them. Uh, of course, most of us would need it, I believe, uh, at that moment. Uh, because we're not uh, conscious of the depth of our need of pardon uh, in, in, in all the ways that it could affect us. And so uh, uh, it's, I suppose, an added assurance, let's put it that way, that the sacrament uh, is administered and uh, the assurance given the soul. And it's such an important moment that, for example, uh, the practice of the church is not to deny the dying person Holy Communion if they're accept, able to accept it there, to have that sacramental union already before they go uh, into eternity. And as our Lord dictated a beautiful prayer to a visionary in Poland, he said, what I want to do is hold you in my embrace and let you fall asleep in my arms and wake up in heaven. Hmm. You know, when, when we think about St. Faustina's uh, diary in the conversations of the merciful God with a despairing soul, I want to get back to that part where um, the despairing soul says, uh, for me, there is no mercy. And we may have relatives that have passed that were maybe in a bad way and we're worried about the state of their soul, but we have to leave it up to the mercy of God. But the falls into greater darkness, a despair, which is a foretaste of hell, and it makes it unable to draw near to God. But Jesus calls to the soul a third time, but the soul remains deaf and blind, hardened and despairing. Then the mercy of God begins to exert itself, and without any cooperation from the soul, God grants it final grace. If this too is spurned, God will leave the soul in the self-chosen disposition for eternity. But this grace emerges from the merciful heart of Jesus and gives the soul a special light by means of which the soul began to understand God's effort, but conversion depends upon his own will. The soul knows that this for her is final grace, and should it show even a flicker of goodwill, the mercy of God will accomplish the rest. Okay, this is interesting because at one point, I don't know how it happened. I came across a thing uh, on the internet where uh, when archeologists found a way to get into the pyramids in Egypt, they were able to enter into the 
burial chamber of, of the people who were placed there. And they found uh, a, 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 around the casket, <clears throat> baskets full of grains of wheat, um, which they believed that the soul needed this nourishment before they passed over the river and, and got into eternity. And this is pagan uh, ideas of afterlife. And they said, those grains were there, some of them maybe more than 2000 years. And they wondered, do they still have life in them? And so they took some out and they planted them. And they did germinate and they grew, flowered and brought forth fruit. And so they said, while they were in the pyramids where it was dark and cold, they were preserved, that the life in the grains were preserved. But when they were exposed to moisture and the warmth of the sun, they germinated, they opened up. And so every soul has that life in it. It may be dead spiritually, but the, the, the seed is still there but it needs to be warmed by our love and that's our prayers. And the moisture is the, the moisture and, and the warmth necessary to let that life to burst forth is supplied by our love, our prayers. And that's why the Lord says pray for the souls so that that life can come forth and they can respond to that warmth and, and that moisture uh, of God's love. Wow, what a beautiful story. And uh, it just makes me realize all the more importance of the power of our prayers. And uh, we have the beautiful communion of saints and we keep praying. And uh, Father, I wanna thank you so much for uh, sharing those thoughts with us uh, on praying for the sick and dying and God's mercy. and. Uh, But remember, we have to repent and we have to ask for his mercy. It's, but it's that ABCs, ask for his mercy, be merciful and completely trust in the Lord. Okay, we ask for his mercy when we say yes, when his warmth starts picking out our life to start. And we say, okay, I agree. Because we, as human beings, we can say no, and then we're sunk. But if we respond, to what our Lord provides to the prayers of the saints uh, and his own desire to save us. And we say yes, and accept that warmth and that moisture, uh, then we are giving God glory and we show our appreciation of his mercy. Well, to God, all the glory and thank you again, Father, for joining and all the people who will be watching us. Thank you for joining us on Hope, Healing and Mercy and we hope to see you next time. Thank you again, Father. God bless you all.